My name is Ken Heeslip. I'm uh, from Canada Life. Worked at the company for 14 years, been around the industry 18 years. A lot of different roles, a lot of fun stuff, but you're not here to hear about that. So uh, I'll let Chloe introduce herself and we'll get right into it. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chloe. I am a DevOps engineer at Canada Life. And yeah, I've been with the company for about two years. Also focused on containerization and cloud migrations, which we'll go delve into today. Yeah. So first, how many people are sick of seeing shipping containers? Yeah, a few, probably. I know I had to do it. It just didn't feel right not to include it in a talk. Um, we'll start with one question here, and this is a, an open-ended. Someone can yell out the answer if you've got it. Uh, what do you get if you cross a computer and a lifeguard? Somebody yell it out, please. Nobody? I did not want to be responsible for delivering this punchline. I was really hoping somebody would do it. It's a screensaver. OK. <laughs> And now we're going to get into it. So uh, our talk is uh, titled, If You Build It, They Will Come. It's a platform modernization journey, total play on Field of Dreams, all that sort of fun stuff. Um, we're going to go over what we did with our on-premise environment, which was uh, struggling and still kind of is, and uh, how we designed and built up a new one in cloud to uh, really enhance our end user experience. All right, yeah, and just to go into further detail, yes, we will be focusing a little bit at first on what's happening in our on-premise environments, what we've done to plan for success, how we've built our own platform as a service, and what we've done to design for operational efficiency, shifting left, and the tooling we've done to resolve a lot of the issues we've had. So to start off, one of our biggest challenges was usability. Um, within our just really outdated Docker Swarm and Rancher environments, our performance was extremely poor, and this was just due to a lack of dynamic node scaling and also lack of pod toleration set. So what we were finding a lot of the times, we had a lot of issues regarding just high demand, there would be pretty much no availability, we would be having issues to schedule critical workloads, and overall led to a lot of downtime, a lot of our customer facing applications did have service interruptions. Um, a lot of the time for any sort of work within this environment, it was manual troubleshooting that had to be done, and our incident response times were extremely poor, quite slow. Um, you know, I'm on the on-call team, so I was getting pulled in to do simple things such as delete pods or restart deployments. And that was also just due to the fact that a lot of our application teams are not familiar with Kubernetes. And through our process, we've been able to resolve this. All right, so uh, some of the other things we had issues with was observability. So in the, uh, in the, in the platform we had in our data center, uh, we left a lot of this configuration up to the tenants or the end users that would be deploying pods into the environment. So we ended up with a lot of uh, mixed match of uh, a mixed match of configurations for how they're logging, if they're logging, what they're logging, which just makes everybody's life uh, not fun when you're trying to deal with some of those on-call things. It was more, it, I think it was actually just, a, hard, it was just as hard to figure out where to get the information as it was to solve the problem most of the time. Um, and all of this, of course, um, without any sort of proper alerting or monitoring on these things, you would end up just having no clue that something's even going wrong until someone complains. There's no opportunity for any sort of retroactive, uh, uh, retroactive look at what's going on or sort of proactive, I guess, is what you'd want to say. Proactive ability to say, okay, over this certain amount of time, we have issues. What can we do to prevent this from actually happening? So it was a bit of a mess. Yes, and all of this did contribute to a very large technical debt. Um, our old versions of our on-premise environments were pretty much just piling on a lot of issues. A lot of the times our application teams would be bringing on upgrades, a lot of updated features that we were not able to deliver because of compatibility issues within our platform. So just to do any changes, any upgrades, this required manual effort and the downtimes were pretty much increasing. Overall, just to modernize, we were pretty much falling further and further behind just due to the fact we couldn't leverage any newer technologies. This one was a big problem. Uh, so scalability was something that was not really factored into it. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the term of uh, POC turns into production. That's kind of what happened with the environment that we're, where we're working in. So a lot of the extra time that you would normally spend working on solutions for these sort of things just wasn't invested. It was meant to be stand it up, prove it works, take it down, do it right next time. Well, you know how that works. It's stand it up, 
deal with it. That's kind of what ended up happening. Um, so in a single data center, we don't have the benefit of things in the clouds like availability zones where we could uh, span services across different regions, or in particular the availability zones is what we focused on here. And uh, scaling when you're dealing with just VMware environment and you don't have access to a lot of that uh, extra tools to hook into the environment to help you scale out your nodes automatically, uh, managed by different teams, all that sort of stuff is very difficult to set up in an on-premise environment. Absolutely, so pretty much this led to a lot of just constant planning and we were making sure we focused on scalable, resilient solutions that met our goals, met our customer needs and all aligned to business objectives. So all this led to building our own platform as a service. So this primarily provided just a consistent platform for application deployment and this is across all of our environments and it has led to just a very easy transition from development all the way to production for our teams now. Um, this has really increased our developers' ability to be productive. We now have, you know, automated uh, pretty much all of our deployment pipelines at this point for at least 90% of it. We've integrated monitoring and we now have built-in security um, features. So we're able to do releases a lot more rapidly and our developers have been able to innovate a bit more quickly. Just having this kind of abstraction of the infrastructure management has really helped our teams to be able to focus a lot more on innovation and not worry as much about any of the underlying infrastructure and not be as dependent upon our platform teams. Okay, so the first thing, I think uh, some of the previous presenters were talking about this, and this is a key, this is huge. I can't stress enough how much of a difference this made to us. Um, collaboration with the customer at every point of the process. So I'm not just referring to we go out, we get a set of requirements, the architect takes it, designs something, builds something, and they finally see it and then say, we don't like this. Um, we did get requirements at first, so we did do that sort of a process. We gathered it, and pretty much two days after we set up our first actual development platform, we started having our largest consumers deploy their development pipelines and services into it. So that gave us pretty much on demand, like live feedback from them, long before we were even ready to consider it a, a proper development pattern that we were using for our platform. So that feedback was excellent and it, it ended up treating more of this type of a service more agile, like you would see software development. So we were able to build that in and because we have our pipeline set up and we're already automating all of our deployment, we had that benefit as well. We could look back in the versions history and see what we had, see what didn't work, and share that knowledge with some of the rest of our teams. Yes, and to just build further upon just the white glove service, a lot of the time for our application teams that were not familiar with Kubernetes, we were pretty much every step of the way helping them with their configurations within the development environment. Within that setup and within completion of that, majority of the time, a lot of our customers now are able to be quite self-sufficient and independent with what they're doing within our testing environments and all the way up to production. And we've built out a bit of a training model through this um, entire journey as well. So this has increased our developer velocity. We've removed a lot of the barriers and we have definitely provided finer tuned streamlined permissions, which we'll go over in further slides. And we've also just ensured that they don't depend upon us as much as they used to and are able to really have the pattern deployment models in place. So this is keeping control. This provides reliable and just really stable environments for our teams. Yeah, she wasn't kidding, by the way. We were actually getting calls at night just to execute kubectl, rollout, restart deployment. Like, no joke. That was an on-call 3 a.m. thing on a regular basis. It was not fun. All right. So this is where we started thinking about, okay, we have some things that our, our end users needs. What do we want out of this? Um, obviously, the less time that we have to spend with things, the better. It gives us more time to, to focus on issues, enhancements, feature releases, anything like that. Uh, before I go any further, who's asleep? Anybody? Brandon, I saw you yawn about five minutes ago. I'm not joking. I saw you from back here. You got to get that under wraps. It's a little big. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 
Okay, so for us, we decided uh, plat uh, managed services as much as possible all the way across the board. So our system's running in AWS. Of course, we chose EKS. You could go with uh, AKS, you could go with GKE. We went with uh, AWS's EKS system. Now we just have to get our code ready, tell it what we want our systems to look like, our uh, control planes, our management planes, it handles it for us. That gives us a lot of flexibility, a lot less time spent trying to figure out when we need to add things, uh, do upgrades even, There's, it makes it simpler for us at that, at that point as well. Um, RDS we're using for backend databases for the platform that we've chose for this, as uh, we'll get into that shortly, but this isn't just straight Kubernetes EKS. It's uh, got a few other toys on top of it that we've chose. Um, again, everything's automated. Um, one of the bigger things we saw in the other environment too was uh, because of the way the permissions were and some of the processes that were in place, we were getting config drift where somebody may troubleshoot an issue in production and make a couple changes, one of them fixes it and the other ones just kind of stay there. Well, if that was done on one node, you have multiple nodes, now we're in a situation where we could have problems across the board still. So config drift was a big one. Uh, the last thing, one of the things that we added just as an open source tool is Valero. So how many, how many of you are familiar with Valero? A few, good. Um, so what that basically gives us is a backup for our cluster configuration specifically. So not the apps, not the data, the cluster config. If somebody deletes a namespace, which has happened, restore the Valero backup for that particular config, carry on with life, good to go. Um, the other piece was environment isolation. We have a lot more information on that later, so I'm just gonna skip past that right now. Mm -hmm. But I'll go into just very quickly what we had done to make improvements to our observability. And one of the key things we did was just the tagging of our resources. This is something that is done now. Once we go into a bit more detail about what we've done with even our naming conventions within our nodes, we now have pretty much network isolation done for each of our teams within our shared cluster environment. So within this structure, this tagging of all of our resources, it's all imported right into Cloudability. It's a bit of a pay-per-use model, but allows our tenants to have pretty much control, direct monitoring over their spending within our environments. And with this, we have definitely been able to reduce our incident management time drastically. As soon as something is coming up within our pretty much our alert systems. We now know exactly what application teams, what support teams we need to be reaching out to, who to escalate to, and we know immediately which applications are being impacted during a major incident. So this has really helped for a lot of our teams to be able to address issues immediately. And the out of box setup that we have for our developers with just the auto collection of logs directly pretty much integrated with Splunk now, we have been able to really allow our teams to be able to see this monitoring right as they deploy into our environments, which we can go into a bit more detail about that setup. So currently right now for the platform build, pretty much we have automatic integration into Splunk and into our security management. So nodes, pods, the gateways, all of that can be seen. And usually right now, even with just the metrics within the UI, this is at the Istio sidecar level that we have just the traffic data being pulled at. And this is allowing for the service to service communication to be easily seen right away for application teams to streamline troubleshooting processes. Yeah, so um, with this, this is one of the first uh, toys that we, we purchased and put in place. It's uh, Tetrate's what solution is. I think they have a booth out here for this weekend actually in, uh, yeah, you do. Yep, usually they see the hands going up in celebration in the back there. Yeah, so uh, what this bought for us, and this was the huge win, is that level of out of the box observability for our endpoints. So Tetrate is built on top of Istio, it's very customized, but they have built in this, uh, this ability to pull all of these network level, essentially communication level metrics straight out of the applications and the services that are running and build a diagram like that for us so we don't have to. That's a big thing. That level of visibility is huge. And as you can see in that picture, uh, we have a couple of services that are running slow and we have one that's showing a 15 millisecond response time. Well, if we don't have that picture and we're trying to troubleshoot an issue, oh man, um, get your syntax out, start hitting Istio CTL, go into logs. You're, you're spending hours potentially to get into some of, those, some of the lower details. But what this gives us is, hey, yeah, that service has an issue. 15 milliseconds, 
it's probably not that service. What is it downstream that could be connected to that? It opens the door to investigate and research the rest of the flow for that, that particular call that's being made and really start to uh, break it down with the developers. Yes, and even with our friendly security enhancements that we've done at this time, one of the tools we are using is TwistLock. This is just to maintain compliance, provides the continuous scanning and just real-time alerts for just any threats. And what we've done with our Carpenter node customizations, we've been able to provide compute and network isolation, which we'll be breaking down into much further detail. But overall, the careful just permission designs that we've had across AWS, EKS, and Tetrate, we have a very robust tenancy model, which we can definitely break down a bit further here. But for the tenancy model, we've been able to ensure that all of our tenants, all of them have their own namespaces, they are able to really see only their own, make changes within their own space. This pretty much prevents for any sort of any other teams to accidentally interfere with their workloads, and we've been able to ensure that they have control over their resources at all times. Yeah, and the key here for anybody that's working on a new platform is the amount of different applications and uh, services along the way that you have to tune the, the permissions with. So in this case, we have AWS permissions we need to be uh, cognizant of. We have permissions within EKS, or Kubernetes level permissions. We have Istio level permissions and Tetrate level permissions. All of that has to be planned and thought out and have like an overall picture of what you want to do. Call it a security architecture if you want to. Patterns of access that you're, you're trying to account for. And that's how we started doing some of it. Yes, and yeah, this model here does break that down a bit more. And this is just representative of just our different teams for like each tenant here. And what we've been able to do is just ensure that the radius blast is really limited here because when they make changes within their own tenant configuration, they're not ensuring, they're not affecting any of the other teams. We're making sure that this doesn't impact our entire cluster when they make their own changes. So we've been able to make sure our environments are stable due to this model here. And overall, we have definitely gotten great feedback from them. We don't have to be as controlling over what we're doing because we've built a great foundation for them to have the leadership to do what they need to test. Yeah, it's like handing themselves a gun with one bullet. Let, you can let themselves shoot themselves in the foot, essentially, is the level of permissions, but you don't want it to be any more dangerous than that. So these, I'll just talk to this little model here. This is another one of those things that's provided to us from, in, from Tetrate. So a lot of you are looking at this and saying, I know what a namespace is, what the heck is the rest of this stuff? Uh, these are logical constructs that are applied by the Tetrate platform for us that give us a little bit of extra, extra control over what's happening. And this is another thing that we used actually when we were talking about uh, the design for your customers. This is designed in a model from an environment perspective that they're familiar with from our on-premise system. So we have dev regions and we have forever on-premise. We have fit regions, we have testing and production. So we were able to build that kind of a structure out in this platform where they would be able to kind of group their resources and everything like that. Uh, this gives us that extra ability, too, to break down the control. So uh, whether it's an Istio sidecar configuration, uh, an access configuration, or a policy or something that we want applied, we can just apply it to one of those constructs at a tenant level, and it applies everywhere across, at a workspace level, and it applies everywhere across, one spot to apply, and then everything just kind of pushes down. That's been big for us as well, for not having to sort out the rest of the mess that comes along with this. Mm -hmm, absolutely, and this really is just down to what we've been doing with our cluster permissions. Um, we do have very much strict segmentation happening with our permissions. For instance, here, even with what we're seeing here for regarding just the roles, it is pretty much a global sort of access that we've given, but we do have for our developer roles, they have the ability to write, create, delete in these environments, and higher up into the production level, they do need to utilize within our cyber arc, our active directory groups that we have set, they have their ability to see within the environment, but will not be able to make changes, which could critically impact the cluster or other teams. So in having just this type of permission model in place, we are making sure that they do have the opportunity to go right ahead, 
perform their testing, make their changes as needed, but without impacting. So we found a bit of a flexible model in which we let them do what they need to do, but we've also maintained the integrity of our clusters by having this model. Yeah, and as platform admins, when you look at something like the Kubernetes permission sets that you see up here, there's obviously things that you don't want them to touch. So our approach for this was starting with, uh, it's just kubectl API resources command, dump everything that's on there. Does it have namespace true? Meaning, can I apply this permission only in a namespace and restrict it there? If that's true, that's a yes to start. Then we will review and kind of go over um, what other things we want to have the have the teams access uh, uh, open to access? So as you were aware, some of these people have just I can create a container, go run it for me, and no other knowledge than that. So we uh, we keep that in mind when we develop these permission sets. So it still may be a little bit restrictive, but it's still open enough that we don't have to get up at night and re restart a deployment. All right, so this is, uh, I think we're running four minutes, I think, left. So this is where we get to the fun and some a little bit of demonstrations on what this auto-scaling stuff for the infrastructure is and how we've really leveraged Carpenter as uh, the root of all of this for us to handle it. Um, so we've already talked about multi-zone configs a little bit. I'm gonna leave that still because there's some diagrams that I'd rather walk through rather than talk to a slide here with a pic without a picture. Um, the key thing here is what we're about to go over really, really depends on the, uh, the app teams that we have in there developing their own horizontal pod autoscaler configurations. It is needed to run in tandem with this or something like that to control when their pods are going to scale because we're only really handling the node side with the rest of this. Um, I'll, I'll save some of these points here. We're talking about self-healing infrastructure. Uh, I'll, I'll use an example off the pictures that were coming up here. All right, so we're gonna run out of time for sure. This is an example of one of the configs that we're using for Carpenter. Is anybody using Carpenter right now? Good, so you've probably seen some of this. If you haven't, this is a bit of an eye-opener for us. Uh, Carpenter handles the node scaling themselves. So in this, um, in this YAML file, I'm just gonna turn and look at the screen here because it's easier. Uh, we have a node pool that's set up. You can see that we've uh, named it, so we're saying uh, Team Blue, it's pretty much. So uh, we've decided to call it network because that was the initial problem that we were trying to solve. Um, anybody that's seen shared clusters knows that um, if you're trying to identify apps in your workloads, you usually have one cluster that's assigned across your subnet unless you've done some pretty uh, crazy <laughs> configurations in there to, to split them out. So we ended up with like slash 20 subnets and God knows how many applications and one firewall rule for one app applies to all of them. That's not good. So that's one thing that we've done here. Um, as we go down, you can see some of the node class breakdowns. That's uh, the next block that's gonna pop up, so I'm not gonna get too much into that, but essentially what it's doing is it's adding taints to the nodes that it's standing up so that only apps with the specific tolerations for it will actually be able to deploy to a specific node group. Um, in the next part here for the requirements, this is where the control really comes. So in, in this situation, we've said for the instances that's gonna stand up in AWS, we only want C or M type. We can specify specific C7XI or whatever in here if we want to. We've just reduced it just to C and M for now. For these ones, we've got uh, CPU selection for eight, 16, or 32. So it will not stand up nodes that do not match those criteria. Um, you see how the rest of it kind of goes. We're, we've um, Obviously, we've included AZs, and that's big for the next part of it. So the availability zones and uh, the the tagging on those nodes it needs to be there for some of the other stuff that we're working on. Uh, last thing on this particular block is the consolidation policy. So the Carpenter is not just scaling the nodes out for us. It's also bringing them back down as the load starts to get less. So we can say uh, after 30 days in this case, or, oh, sorry, that's underutilized. See, I'm starting to lose it now. Everybody wanna breathe for me? Okay, well, laughing works too. Okay, Th I appreciate the effort, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna skip through because we're running out of time. This is the rest of the other piece of the configuration for the node classes. You can see you have drive configurations that we can do in there. Um, also at the bottom, you can see some of the tagging that we've applied that gets created automatically and torn down with these nodes as they stand up. These are ones that tie into our, our billing systems. 
and into our CMDB system as well. So node stands up, CMDB is able to read it, it has a record, node goes down, it's gone. And that looks like what the, uh, the customers have to put into their deployment file to specify that they're actually looking for something for a, uh, a blue team node. And this is the last one, right on time. Uh, I'll skip that. And it, this is a picture of what it all looks like at the end, right? And so you've got these nodes that are spread across the availability zones. Uh, when your deployments are going in, there's rules that stop them from, uh, from, can I take a couple extra minutes? She's giving me the, yeah, get on with that, okay. Yeah, okay. All right, so we're just gonna do this. I've got, a, I've got an application running here, and I've told it that its max skew is one, so it means it can't have a pod running at a difference of one more than another AZ. So as we're sitting right now, it's got two running, one in AZ1, one in two, one in three. Max skew is one, we're happy. Something happens, it needs to deploy, can't go here, that's not that team's node. So it's uh, gonna try to put it here, can't go here, that would put the max skew at two. It can't go here either, max skew is still gonna be two. So it goes into unscheduled status because there's no nodes available for it. Carpenter says, I can help you with that. You need a node for blue team? Perfect. It'll provision it on the fly for us, and the pod will be able to deploy. There you go. Was oh, that a minus 59 seconds? Oh, so sorry. So that's that. That's uh, that's where we ended up. It's a lot to cover under 25 minutes. <laughs>